white against Victor Korchnoi of Switzerland playing black. And already in this international chess tournament for the Master Game Trophy and two and a half thousand pounds, all the pressure on the hot favourite, Victor Korchnoi, the man who played Anatoly Karpov for the World Championship. And this week and next week we're going to concentrate on his group, Group B, led at the moment by Lothar Schmidt, after that truly remarkable win Schmidt had over Korchnoi in the first round. Tonight, Korchnoi has to beat Robert Bernstein any chance at all of staying in the tournament even. And with me, as usual, is Bill Hartston to give commentary and expert analysis. Bill, what chance do you give Korchnoi playing black against the stolid, safe Robert Byrne? Well, they're already embroiled in one of the most complex variations of one of Korchnoi's favourite openings, the French defence. I think Korchnoi will be quite content with the complex position they've got. After Byrne's usual opening move of E4, Korchnoi gave up the e5 that, that he lost to Schmidt with, playing the French defence, e6. Black striking back in the centre with d5. And Byrne plays his knight to c3, the most aggressive square for it. Korchnoi pinning the knight and white closing the centre. This is Korchnoi's favourite variation. It's very complex because Black is committed to exchanging this bishop for knight. Bishop attacked by the pawn and having to take. Now, in exchange for giving up the bishop pair, black has crumpled white's pawns on the queen's side. Very sharp position now. Well, let's join the game now with Viktor Kochnoi, black to play. I played this position several times with Spassky. He quickly um, was developing his uh, king side. Later on, I think I found some improvement. Mm, so, okay, queen a5. Well, I, I know very well that uh, Victor likes this defense. And in, in fact, uh, right now, he is the world's leading expert on it. But, but I can't resist challenging him with it. Uh, I like bishops, and the variation has given me the bishop pair. But the whole question is how to open up the game. But that has to be reserved for later. First of all, the development has to be completed and the pawn must be defended. Bishop d2. Yes, and... Uh, well, against uh, Spassky I played bishop d7. And later I came to the conclusion it's not enough for equality. And that's a six. I don't uh, quite know where to put my king bishop in this variation. I've almost always played it to d3 before, but on the other hand, that can lose a tempo when, when black plays the cramping advance c4. Uh, but I don't like to put it on e2. It isn't very aggressively placed there. So, bishop d3. Mm, yes, after bishop e2, I had a choice between queen a4 or b6, like that. Mm, now, b6 looks strange. Well, I must play c4. Now, bishop e2 is orthodox here, but in some earlier games I have experimented with bishop f1, and I think I'm going to do that now. It looks strange to undevelop like that, I know, but, but often the bishop is better placed at, after g3, the bishop is better placed at g2 or h3. So I think I'll try that now, bishop f1. Mm -hmm. Now, if I play bishop d7 with the idea to cast long, he plays knight g5. Oh, he, he doesn't allow me um, to finish development without uh, making new weaknesses. Uh, I can play now, I can try now f6. It looks, looks dangerous a bit. Uh, probably castle, short castle, probably is better. But uh, they, my 
tournament situation is uh, so difficult that I, I shouldn't be afraid of difficulties. Okay, F6. Well, he, he plays that counterattack in the center. Uh, he likes to play that in this formation. But this time he hasn't got his bishop on d7 yet. And his king looks a little bit exposed. So I'm going to open up the game, I think, and, and, and see if I can get some tactical play against the king. E takes F. Pawn takes F6 is essential. I don't want him to be the first one to play knight G6 or knight F5 himself. So, knight H4. Hmm. Well, the only, the only move, castle. Well, he did it. But he... I know how well he defends his king. And, of course, I can't get at it right away. I can't do anything until I complete my development. So, G3. Well, G4 was also playable a bit more sharp, of course. Well, if I play bishop d7, he, he plays bishop h3. I don't like it. Uh, so I'll I have to wait. I'm waiting move. Good. Rook f7. I don't feel it would be right to attempt anything with queen h5. And queen g4 check is meaningless. I don't really see a follow-up. I can't do anything, I think, without getting further development. Therefore, bishop g2. Good. Mm. No. I finished my development to bishop d7. Castles. I can try to come with my knight to c8, d6, e4. Well, he would not wait. He... He can play after knight c8, he can play queen g4, queen f4, or f4, knight d6, f5. Well, sooner or later he, his bishops will play. And uh, before he plays uh, f4, I, ha I have to try to change his knight. And if he retreats to f3, it's, it's okay. So, well, knight g6. I think that was the only forward-looking move he could make. Now, going back is a waste of time, and I, I would be blocking my, my bishop on g2 if I were to return to f3. Perhaps I can exploit some weakness in the kingside pawns if I take the knight. I really think it's the only move, so therefore, knight takes g6. Yes, his move is um, well, the best practical, I think. Pawn takes to six. Now, if I'm going to be consistent in following up that knight capture, I ought to play at some point here h4 and try to break open a line to his king with h5 so that if he tries to pass with g5, I can break the whole position open by playing f4. Well, so, what is he going to do about h4? Bill, it sounds as if uh, Robert Byrne has a very clear idea of what he's doing, what he's trying to do. Do you think he's in a better position at the moment? I quite like Byrne's position here. Um, his idea, of course, is to open the position with, with h4, h5. As he said, this Korchnoi king is very exposed. He's allowed these weaknesses to come in his king position. Um, what White has to worry about is that if he loses the initiative, then these this mass of black centre pawns can become very dangerous. In this sort of game, Korchnoi is going to be defending for quite some time his, his king position, but then he wants to get these central pawns rolling. If that happens, then black is better. Might have a look at the clock here, because Korchnoi has got into time trouble on all sorts of occasions. At the moment, he's spent 40 minutes over his 16 moves, burn 34 minutes over his 17. Let's go back to the game with Korchnoi Black to play. 
Oh, yes. His position is clearly better. Um, well, because uh, his king is better protected, because he has two bishops, and uh, they don't play right now, but uh, sooner or later the position will get open, and, uh, well, I have to prevent um, by all means to, to, well, to open the position. So, rook h7 first against h5. I knew I could not expect it to be so easy to play h5. Uh, it just wouldn't be sound for him to have allowed me to do that. On the other hand, how can I continue my attack? Queen g4 is just a, a blow into the air. You can play king g7 or king f7. And eventually, my queen is going to have to get out of the line of that bishop on d7. So, I don't have a, a clear continuation of this plan, so I, I think I will settle for more mobility first, bring my rook into action. Rook e1. Just some relief. Rook e8 quickly, in order, well, after rook b1 to play bishop c8. I would like to infiltrate and create some weak squares. So, I can attack the f-pawn with a gain of tempo with queen f3. And it would be very bad for him to try to use the pin of my c-pawn by playing knight takes d4 because I would simply play queen takes f6, breaking up his kingside pawns, and he would not be able to play knight takes c2 because of queen takes g6 check and queen takes c2 winning a piece. So it's tactically correct. It must be a good move. Queen f3. Of course, I, I can retreat with the queen back to d8, but uh, still... The queen on a5 somehow annoys him. It takes one pawn, it takes another pawn. So, well, my rook on h7 is misplaced, well, misplaced. But what can I do? King g7. Well, now that my c pawn is defended by the queen, my bishop is free for more aggressive work. My queen bishop. Now, I would like to put it at f4, where it commands a useful diagonal. And would I have to worry about e5? Let's see, on e5, d, e, f, e, bishop g5, and I am threatening both to penetrate with queen f6 check, as well as to take the d-pawn. No, there's no tactical refutation possible, so bishop f4. Yes, I have to play carefully. Mm, I have to protect my black squares on the king's side. Eventually, the bishop can can inflict me much harm. Okay, knight d8. It's a good move. I'm afraid it's going to make possible a very stubborn defense of the black position. He obviously intends to go to f7 with it, where it covers all of the major squares, d6, e5, g5, h6, that my bishop bears down on. I will mobilize a rook. Perhaps I can put some pressure later on the e-line. A rook e2. Oh. Knight of seven. Now, it's always a problem in this winnower. Every time I've played it, I've found it the same thing. How to proceed. It looks at times as though, in this opening, both sides get stuck in a sticky pudding after about 15 moves. I wish I had a marvelous plan that I could just go into carefree, but I don't see anything obvious. Now, what about my last move, rook e2? I'm, I'm not ready to play rook on a to e1. Victor takes pawns. You can't just give them away 
blithely. And he'd eat the A pawn if I were to double on the E line without a positive result. Oh, and my queen is not free. It's it's taken over the bishop's function of guarding the C pawn, but but I want to be able to do something with it. I still can't find a clear plan. I'm going to try to reorganize my pieces and see what turns up. I hate to admit my last move was a lost tempo, but I'm going to play rook e3. Perhaps I can bring the queen behind the rook without having to sacrifice the a pawn and put some pressure on his e6 pawn. Well, it's not clear, but I'm going to play rook e3. Mm -hmm. Bet I will... Bet I will improve position of my rook now. Well, I have a lot of troubles, but at least to put all the pieces together. Rook h8. All right, the rook h8, the rooks are connected once again. Right, all right, I'm going to see what I can do on the e line. Queen e2. Maybe he can do nothing, because here his pawn c3 is not protected. I will try bishop c6 and, well, what he's doing now. Oh, that's an aggressive move, and it's a good one. I can't take the e6 pawn. He can exchange on e6 and take my c3 pawn, and my, my whole pawn position comes apart. But... But maybe I'm going to have to use that other rook on the e line after all. Very well, I'll make room for it. Queen d2. Of course, he, he couldn't play bishop h3. I, I would play e5, and then uh, uh, after e5, take, take, bishop takes e5, rook takes e5, rook takes e5, queen takes e3, taking the rook a1. And I have at least uh, the equal ending. So, well, but now I have to double my rooks on e line. Rook e7. Well, he's not going to have any weaknesses on the uh, on the e line after that. Uh, I want to make sure that at some point my bishop on f4 has enough mobility, so it won't be in danger. I better do that before I do anything else. Rook e2. Uh, yes, perhaps uh, here I should play something like uh, a five, I don't know, and then to to walk with the king back to d7. But I have no time to, to think. I I need, uh, well, to, to play more aggressively now. Rook e8. Yes, all right. He wants to do something aggressive on the e line. But now that my h pawn is finally out from under attack, I'm going to try to break through on the dark squares, beginning with g4. And here we find ourselves in a familiar position, Burn having 27 minutes to play his next 14 moves, and unfortunately leaving himself just five minutes. Now he has to play 40 moves in the first two hours, and he's got to play 15, 16 moves in just five minutes. Bill Hartson takes up the commentary until the time control. My coach has been playing this phenomenally well. Here comes his e5 advance, which he's prepared so well. Two rooks, knight, pawn, all defending that. Bishop comes back, and the pawn advances. Courtenay is taking control now. Byrne has to find something to do. Still playing this black squared plan, trying to weaken the black squares, leading to Courtenay's king. This pawn exchange has made this diagonal a little vulnerable. This knight on f7 still defending so beautifully. It was a lovely maneuver, knight c6, d8, f7. Burns still finding it difficult to fi find an active plan. Rook back to e3. Now the queen at last coming back. It's been annoying him so much attacking these two pawns. Now Korchmai feels ready to switch back to the king's side. Burn doing little more than marking time here. I think and Burns King running to the other side. I think he senses danger. Yes, we're coming back to the h file. The last time it was there, it was just preventing a white breakthrough. Now, Korchner is getting more active. 
trying to exchange this bad black, black bishop. Well, white, white couldn't take because of the open e-file. Lost his queen. King's still running. Now this bishop attacked twice by queen and rook. Where can it go? <laughs> I think that was the only square, b8. Really, white's in a mess. This bad bishop gone. Rook taking back. Now black's left with this powerful knight against a bishop blocked by its own pawns. A pair of rooks, yes, rooks being exchanged here. This pawn looks doomed. Yes, knight takes it. Conchon has winning position here. This bishop is, is doing nothing at all. Black's completely free. All the white squares are his. It is amazing how Conchon can get into such time trouble and then suddenly in three or four minutes completely explode the position and take charge of the game. It's, it's absolutely typical for the way he plays. He, he likes to solve all the strategic problems in the first 25 moves, as he did, and then he can just polish off the rest in, in five minutes. Mm. Queen's coming off here. Queen check. Conchon, I must be very confident this ending's won. And with this bishop, all these pawns stuck on black squares. Rook coming to attack the f-pawn. It really looks bad for Byrne here. Well, Byrne's position has certainly deteriorated very markedly over the last 15, 16 moves. Let's go back to the game with uh, Robert Byrne White to play his 45th move and see what he thinks about it. I don't really have any defense at this point. I really just am giving him a chance to show his, his technique. Because if I play bishop g3 here, for example, it doesn't stop him. He plays e3, fe, rook f1 check, king b2, he exchanges rooks, plays knight e4, and my extra e-pawn is meaningless while he queens his g-pawn. Well, I can't do that. I, I, whatever I do, I've got to get my rook into the game and prevent its exchange. Mm, yes, he missed his best chance. Bishop e5 check was much stronger. Like, uh, that after king h6, he could play king b2, threatening the, the check and uh, nearly mm, mate from h1. Yeah, now I have my chance, yes. E3, I ch if he takes on E3, I, I change the rooks. E3. Yes, of course, he can still carry out that plan. Well, it really isn't useful going on any further here, but I'll play a few moves. So, I, I can't allow the exchange of rooks, and I can't lose my pawn. I must play F4. Yes, and now I have uh, the move E2, King G2, Knight e4 check, king e3, knight takes e3, rook e1, and uh, eventually I lose the pawn e2. Mm. And if I play knight e4, uh, the question, can I uh, uh, keep the pawn e3? If, yes, I can. I see I can, I can keep the pawn. Knight e4. Well, there's nothing more to do but to get my... Rook into play as fast as I can. King b2. Yes, I have the only move, but quite strong. g5. Oh, yes. That's even faster than I thought. Well, I can't permit him to take still another pawn. I have to exchange, even though that opens the line for his rook. fg. Yes, e2. I want the queen. But I will make one last gesture. Rook e1. Yes, after bishop e5, king g6, bishop f6, I could win by one tempo. Knight takes g5. Oh, but now it is easier. Rook f2. Well, now I must resign. This is just impossible. He can take his, his good sweet time playing king g6, king takes g5. King g4, f3, d2, if he likes. Or even knight d2 to f3. No, I can't continue. I have to resign. That was yes. a good game by you, Victor. Yes. 
I, I just couldn't form a plan in the middle of it there. Those positions of the oh, winner. Bill, uh, Robert Burns said that he was just going on playing for quite a long time there to let uh, Victor Kochnoy show off his technique. Let's do something which we don't very often do and show how a resigned position could actually have been irrevocably resolved. Yes, you can see this, this position, Burn really has absolutely nothing to do. His rook is stuck on e1 just to blockade this pawn. If it goes away from e1, the black rook comes to f1 and stops it. Uh, the bishop has absolutely nothing to do on the black squares. Uh, the king can't come around to, to help the pawn. It can get as far as c1, but the d2 square is covered by the knight. So black's free to do exactly what he wants. And he can either win it the quick way, bringing the knight from e4 to d2 to f3, killing this rook on e1, or, if he really wants to be sadistic, do it the slow way. King to g6, king takes g5, king g4, king f3, e3, and even king d2 at the end. This rook is just going to die, leaving black. Whole rook up, winning very easily. It's like the Chinese water torture, isn't it? Horrible. <laughs> I don't know what you think, but watching that game, I think, I got a very slight impression that even though he had the white pieces, Robert Byrne really played it very slightly passively, perhaps. I think Korchnoi made it look that way. Uh, Byrne was, was trying to do something early in the game, and Korchnoi just, just defended and stopped him making anything of his early initiative. It, it's mm. a superb feat by Korchnoi to reduce a grandmaster of Byrne's strength to such helplessness. Mm. And of course, one forgets that Robert Byrne is a, a top-ranking grandmaster. He's, after all, been in serious contention for the World Championship before, has he not? He, yes, he, he told me, um, just lunchtime today, uh, how close he came to winning the World Championship. It was uh, during his match with Spassky in 74, which put him out of contention. Um, just before the match, he was in Brazil, and he sought out a high priestess of voodoo, whom he said looked about 200 years old with a hangover, and he asked her advice for what to do against Spassky. She recommended that he get a glass of Brazilian rum, leave it on the corner of the board, don't drink it, slit the throat of a chicken, and drip the blood in a circle round the board. He didn't take this advice, and he lost the match. While the game was being played, he was supposed to do all this? I think that would have been against FIDE rules, but I think doing it before the game, it's okay. Well, lovely. It's a pity, really, that Robert Burns gone from this tournament, because he can't now qualify. He still has the game with Schmidt. That should be fun. Right, tonight's game, Korchnoi's victory means that Korchnoi at least stays in contention. It really was a terribly, terribly important game for him. But everything for him now hangs on waiting what happens to other players in his group. Next week we're going to stay with Group B, which stands like this now. Uh, Korchnoi has a point, Schmidt has a point, but Schmidt has his all-important game in hand, and the all-important game in hand is against Michael Steen of Great Britain. Interesting uh, thought about this game is that uh, Korchnoi, having played against Byrne tonight, uh, Schmidt, having beaten Korchnoi, now takes on the man who was Korchnoi's second against Karpov in Baglia City last year, Michael Steen. So perhaps Michael Steen can not only do himself good, but can do his mentor Korchnoi good by beating Schmidt. All that in the future. We shall see it next week. Until then, from all of us here in Bristol, good night. Interesting game next week.